Hi friends, thank you for tuning in to the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm Bethany Lewis, the Concussion Coach. I'm a neurological occupational therapist and certified life coach, and I specialize in guiding people through their concussion recovery journey. I am passionate about helping people understand their injury, speed up their recovery, and reclaim control over their life post-concussion. The purpose of this podcast is to help increase awareness of concussions and the impact they can have on a person's life, and to bring hope to people who have suffered a concussion and those who love them. I firmly believe that sharing stories and knowledge about concussions will bring important light and understanding to this misunderstood and often invisible injury. The information in this podcast is meant to bring that awareness and hope and is not meant as medical advice. The opinions shared are those of the interviewees and my own. If you are suffering with lingering concussion symptoms, I have created a concussion coaching program specifically for you. I will be your mentor to guide you through your recovery journey, offering help with understanding and managing your symptoms, setting achievable goals, and learning how to manage your own thoughts and nervous system in order to get control over your life again. If this program sounds like something that would help you or someone you love, sign up for a free consultation. In the consultation, you'll get valuable information and resources and gain hope for your future. Sign up for your free consultation at the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Hi friends, welcome to this episode of the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm excited to introduce you today to my friend, Jenny Drake. Jenny has been coaching for over a decade and guides men and women back to themselves. She has published a self-love intention journal, which is available on Amazon. She hosts the podcast, Falling in Love with Yourself, which is in its third season. This year, she'll be hosting the Falling in Love with Yourself Beach Retreat in October. Jenny lives in Hermosa Beach, California, and is the mom of two. She spends her free time running, playing board games, and hanging out at the beach with friends, which sounds quite heavenly. (laughs) Um, Jenny and I met when we both lived in Beijing, China back in 2011, 2012. And we shared in that adventure of living in a foreign country together and came to love each other and the other friends that we made there quite deeply. Um, And we've kept in touch over the years through social media. And I can't believe this, but it was almost a year ago. um, She invited me to be on her podcast. And I'll put a link to that conversation in the show notes. And it was so fun to reconnect and for me to really ponder on self-love and why it's important. And since then, I've wanted to have Jenny on my podcast and today's the day. (laughs) So I'm excited to hear her wisdom around this important topic of self-love, particularly as it relates to people who have experienced post-concussion symptoms. I have found in working with many people struggling with the effects of a concussion that one of the things they wrestle with is loving themselves when so much of what they loved and defined themselves by is different or gone. So I thought that self-love would be an excellent topic and Jenny would be a perfect person to help shed some light on this for us. So thank you for being here, Jenny. I'm so excited to hear from you today. Thanks, Bethany. I am thrilled and I'm sitting here. It's Saturday morning. I'm in my swimsuit, ready to hang with friends at the beach later. And there's no better way to kick off the weekend than to have this conversation. I love you. Beijing was such a pivotal time for me. It's really when I started truly diving into loving myself. And so you were a part of that. And so I just think it's so cool that here we are, you know, over 10 years later, connected, coaching others, sharing our, you know, souls and our authenticity together and and with our communities. So Thank you so much for having me. I'm incredibly grateful. Thanks, Jenny. Yes, I'm so excited. This is going to be a a really good conversation and I'm so grateful for our friendship. So so tell me why, like, let's take kind of a big picture here to start with. Why is it important for people to love themselves? Why is this even a topic of discussion? Yeah, I believe, and my message to the world is anything that we're struggling with, anything, like anything, whether it's physical setbacks like a concussion or post symptoms of concussion or relationship issues or not feeling purpose in our careers. I have learned throughout my life and now what I, my message is, it all comes back to the relationship with ourself. And when we can reconnect back to ourselves and really find our truth and then love ourselves. First, we have to accept ourselves, all parts of ourselves, including the ones that we don't really like or that we shame or that we try and fix or judge or diminish. 
when we go on this journey, oh my goodness, all of a sudden our physical health gets better. Our relationships get better. Our careers get better. It just really goes back to that relationship with ourselves. And the majority of us are walking around being really mean to ourselves and really shaming ourselves and having a lot of negative self-talk. And we wonder why life is not happy. And so I just feel so passionate to spread this word of, hey, let's take a look at our inner world. So Yes. So important. Thank you. And what brought you to doing this in the first place? Well, my own journey for sure. Right. Like I was always a really happy and fulfilled person. And then I wasn't (laughs) for years, like decades. And it was because I had become disconnected from my truth, my authentic self. And I was living life in that space where I was looking for external validation. I was looking towards the scale to help me love myself or my career to help me love myself. Definitely my marriage. I put so much pressure on my husband at the time to fill those empty vessels And I just, I was work, I, you know, that's when I was, you know, religious at the time, I was placing all of my self-worth on how obedient and perfect I could be in my religion and to God. And I was really putting in a lot of effort in all of those areas of life. And I was just falling deeper, deeper, deeper into darkness and into a hole. Nothing was helping me feel happy, love, joyous, and free. And it took me to go to Beijing, China to really figure it out. It took me, you know, God, universe, whatever we choose to call it, took me out of my normal life, my comfort zone, and put me in a foreign country. And I went there kicking and screaming, like I did not want to move to China, you know, and I made it very well known. But it was there in China that I hit my proverbial rock bottom of like darkness. And I had to start digging myself out. And it was doing things that all of a sudden were for me, which was taking care of myself. And we'll go into more detail when we specifically talk about concussions in a, in a minute. But that was when I started digging myself out of my hole where I was like, nobody's going to do this for me. I have to do it for myself. So that was the beginning of it. And I started coaching right when we came back in 2013. And I was coaching in a health and fitness realm or industry. But all of it for me was about self-love. Like, I'm not going to get healthier or more fit hating myself and wanting to change myself and wanting to fix myself. Really, I found out that loving myself as is, was the path to progressing into a healthier physical life. And that was kind of how I learned that. And then I just really was like, whoa, this is the path to all progress, to all evolution. This is such a more peaceful, efficient path to growth than shaming myself and being mean to myself. So, and then, you know, how I became to do it full time was a journey in in and of itself, because, you know, I wanted security, I wanted the job and I wanted health insurance. And I was coaching in all sorts of ways in every aspect of my life. And then finally, it was a career coach that gave me the permission that I could give myself permission to just do it full time. And, you know, what we put out to the world comes back full force. And now I do it full time. And yeah, I have this thriving life that is just amazing and so fulfilling. I love it. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, one of the things that came to my mind is you're talking about how we can't shame ourselves into loving ourselves and being happy. The coach that I follow a lot is uh, Jody Moore. And she, I remember her saying, you can't row south to get north (laughs) like you can't just like beat yourself up to get to a place where you're happy and and in love with yourself and your life (laughs) so it just it just it makes sense if you like look at it that way so I'm sure we'll talk more about that in a minute 
So what have you found in your coaching that uh, makes it hard for people to love themselves? Like what, yeah, what have you observed? You know, we just give everyone else the forgiveness and the benefit of the doubt, and we forget to do it to ourselves. We are carrying so much from our past, either past mistakes or past choices, and we don't even know that we're carrying it around. And so that's why, you know, people say to me all the time, well, don't you just want to be a life coach instead of a self-love coach? I think it's so important to have somebody in your life to point out that we're carrying such this heavy load that we would have forgiven others possibly and we're not forgiving ourselves. So I think that self-forgiveness is such a path to clearing blocks of loving ourselves. And, and that's just something, self-forgiveness is something we don't talk about enough. Mm. That's actually, yeah, that's a really good point. So I know that you have four pillars of self-love that you structure your coaching around. Can you tell us what those are and how they are helpful for people? Yeah, yeah. So in my former life, um, I always say before China, um, I was a school teacher. So my teaching really comes out in my coaching. And for me, I broke down my own self-love curriculum for myself and what I coach through, through four pillars. And that is self-awareness. They kind of go in order, but not really. But really focusing on self-awareness is kind of the key that unlocks our door of self-love. Like a lot of us, and me included, was spending a lot of time looking more at other people and our situations rather than ourselves. And because it's scary, we're going to see things that we probably don't want to see, but this is the like doing it in the most loving way. So my first pillar is self-awareness and then self-acceptance because accepting things about ourselves the way that we are as is right like we are worthy and perfect right where we are we don't need to fix ourselves we i i never really use the term self improvement it's you know a path of self growth that we're on because we are worthy of everything including love as we are but we can grow and lead a more happy and fulfilling life when we come to accept who we are in this moment. The best way I can describe that is like if we're on a weight loss journey, it always goes back to physical because it's such a tangible way to love ourselves. Like I want to be healthier or I want to shed some, you know, unwanted pounds but can I love myself as is? Can I accept myself as is? Can I be happy where I am and then become different and evolve and grow? So that's self-acceptance. That's pillar number two. Can I throw yeah. something out there? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds, it, I can see where a lot of people would say, wait a second, if I love myself where I am, if I accept myself, then I'm not going to want to change. How, how, that's not the way that you've totally. it. That's like our protection mechanism coming in. Our protection mechanisms jump in to keep us where we're at, right? So, and I totally, right when you said that, it brought me back because that was me too. Well, if I accept myself exactly where I'm at, I'm going to get stagnant and I might even go backwards. Well, that is a fear trying to hold us where we're at. And it's totally not true. Acceptance is not stagnation. Acceptance isn't throwing up the white flag and saying, I give up. Acceptance is I am worthy as is. I want to be better or different or healthier or, you know, whatever, but I can accept myself where I'm at and that, that it does take practice. It is a total societal mind shift. That's like a more soul-based spiritual concept than a human concept. And it takes practice for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for pointing that out interrupt yeah. anytime. Cause I could just go on forever. Um, and then the third pillar after self-awareness and self-acceptance is self-compassion and self-compassion is really kind of the umbrella over it all. 
Like that is the pillar that we practice the majority of the time. Most of the time when we are discontent with ourselves, it's because we're not leaning into compassion and it's really hard. It's not, again, it's not something that we were raised to embody self-compassion, right? Like as children, we are talked to and taught about how to treat everyone else. And we're not taught how to treat ourselves. So to grow our self-compassion, it's very intentional. And I am a very spiritual person. I am not religious anymore, but I do believe in a power greater than myself. And so I have practiced when I'm having a hard time finding compassion for myself, I ask for it. I ask my higher power. I ask my source for more compassion for myself. And guess what? It's there. And that really is the premise of all of self-love. We are humans having a spiritual experience. And so when we tap into, you know, a vessel that we don't have enough of, I ask for it. If I am struggling with self-forgiveness or self-compassion, I ask my source for it because my source, my creator, whatever, you know, we can call it whatever we want to, that's infinite and abundant. And so self-love is a very spiritual practice. So I, uh, you know, I could do a whole podcast episode or a whole session just on self-compassion in and of itself. But the fourth principle, the fourth pillar of self-love is self-fulfillment. And this is another one we forget. These are for the people, the clients that come to me and say, I don't even know who I am anymore. Because again, we have been taught so much in our life by society, by, you know, religion and by our parents to put our needs, our wants, our desires to the side, especially as moms, especially Mm -hmm. as moms, you know, like take care of everyone else first. And I hear all the time. I don't even know what I like anymore. I don't even know what brings me joy anymore. And so self-fulfillment, that pillar is huge. And a lot of times when clients first come to me, that's where we start is who are you right now? And let's reconnect back to your truth. And that was the biggest part of my journey is when I say I was living a life totally out of my own truth and authenticity, I had totally disconnected from everything I wanted and desired. So coming, yeah, coming back to that would be an important way of connecting and finding that. So the self-fulfillment is that like allowing yourself to, to embrace the things that you do love and, and exploring those things. Or is it more like allowing yourself to, how do I phrase this? To love yourself as you are and to fulfill your own needs. I don't know if that makes sense. All of that, all of that. Self-fulfillment, that's kind of the pillar where we talk about getting back in touch with our voice and speaking our truth and asking for our needs. But before we ask our partner or our boss what our needs are, And before we can speak our truth, we need to know what our truth is. And it could be as small as, you know, we have pizza every night for every Friday night because that's our tradition. Well, I don't like pizza. So, you know, we we do it over time where we just, you know, out of compromise. And and I'm not saying like self-love and self-fulfillment is like having these rigid walls and and barriers up like definitely compromise is part of it but over time we give away so much of our voice and so so much because we we feel guilty right we we think we're too much or we're too needy or too this or too that and so a lot of us go through and we start to minimize and we start to be quieter and a lot of people haven't disconnected it's more some of my clients it's just hey you have permission to ask for what you need. And definitely you touched upon it. One of my greatest tools that I went through with myself is how to meet my own needs. You know, that was the most empowering thing. And the mo- that built my self-worth and self-confidence the most because I'm a baby of five and I went straight from, you know, college to marriage. And I really 
was never taught how to meet my own needs until I was a single woman, single at, you know, 47. And again, nobody was going to come to my rescue. And that, that was incredibly empowering. And so that's another aspect of self-fulfillment is how can I meet my own needs? And self-soothing comes in, you know, when we're struggling and when we're in pain and when we're suffering, how can I make myself feel safe? How can I make my, how can I give myself the love that I am so craving from someone else right now? Not that we're putting up walls, not that we're, you know, isolating ourselves, but meeting our own needs at the same time we can add. And sometimes it is asking for someone to give us the hug or hold us, or I'm feeling unsafe. So that, that all, you know, there's a lot that goes into these four pillars. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And yeah, as you were talking, like all of these things, I'm like, oh my gosh, this, yeah, it just fits in really perfectly with so much of the, the coaching principles that I use as well. And the, yeah, it's, I love the structure that you put here and I can see how it's extremely helpful. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so let's dive into more specifically people who are dealing with concussions or some, even if it's not a concussion specifically, but a life-changing event that they weren't expecting, weren't wanting. So I've observed that a consistent challenge for people struggling with the after effects of concussions is loving who they are now with all of the changes and the loss of so much of what they loved and defined themselves by. And how does someone maintain self-love in their current moment when they feel like they've lost so much of who they are. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm so excited to dive into this because this happens throughout our life so many times where something happens that we have not planned for and it it like literally pulls the rug out from underneath us. And I, I didn't just go through a concussion, but I'm a runner. And I just went through an injury that took me out of running for about four months. And so I just went through a process where a lot of my identity, a lot of my self-fulfillment, a lot of my happiness was wrapped into running. And that's not even the physical aspect. That's like the soul part of it. And all of a sudden I couldn't do it anymore and possibly not do it for the rest of my life. And so what normally happens is our ego or that part of our brain comes in and tries to connect the dots of what part is mine? What part, how did I cause this? What, how could I have prevented it? And it's really important to understand like that's our mind and that's its job and that's okay. But we don't have to allow that to take over because then, then that's where, right? Under all of that comes self-blame. I should have, you know, and, and I was like, I shouldn't have attached so much identity to running, you know, and all this stuff. And so when something happens and we automatically turn to ourselves for blame or responsibility or all of that, we start to really take on that self-criticism and, and all of that. And so that's the first step is know it's normal to go there, but don't stay there. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Because, and, and a lot of what I coach is about acceptance. Like I'm not one of those coaches. that's like, push that away. And I don't believe in burying things. Um, you know, I, I have, been in therapy for a really long time. And one of my very favorite things that my therapist taught me is invited in for tea, sit, whatever it is, whether it's fear, whether it's loneliness, whether it's sadness, invite it in for tea and then walk it to the door and ask it to leave. And I love that. Mm -hmm. That how loving is that that we get to face these parts of ourselves, that self-blame, and then be done with it and ask it to leave. So when things happen, really don't lean into the self-blame. And then whatever we're talking about, whether it's concussion or loss of a job or loss of a loved one, or, you know, our life changing drastically, allow ourselves to go through the stages of grief yes. without any expectations on ourselves, 
without any timeline. And that is so hard. I'm, I'm going to cry for a minute because it doesn't, people think that grief only has to do with death. But when I gave myself permission to grieve my relationship with running and my relationship with body, that was when I started to progress towards acceptance of, okay, I'm sad about this. I'm angry about it. I'm hurt. And then, you know, the stages of grief include bargaining, you know, how can I run a little bit, you know, or, or how can I get the same, you know, meditative soul, spiritual experiences in a different way. And just taking the pressure off that I'm allowed to grieve something like running or my relationship with running. And I get to do it my own way in my own timeline. And that is the path. I always say like peace is on the other side of acceptance, allowing ourselves to grieve something. And I know your listeners can relate to this. Like part of grieving is grieving the loss for the future that we thought we had. Yes, 100%. And so I went through that, like after my divorce, I had to grieve the fam, the future family and the future experiences that I had looked forward to. So when you talk about like life changing things, it really is about grieving what we thought our life would look like. And then getting back into the present, coming back to present. And it might be in that suffering moment What I tell myself, and this is part of my self-soothing, is I'm safe. I'm breathing. I have a roof over my head. I'm safe in this moment. All of my needs, all of my basic needs are being taken care of. And that is like the, the, the start of gratitude. If we can't, if we're so dark and so low, we can go to that space. I have a bed to sleep in. I have air in my lungs. And that starts to change that energy to, okay, I'm going to be okay. I might not be, I might not be happy in this moment, or I might still be suffering, but I'm okay. So I touched upon, you know, grieving. I touched a little bit upon gratitude. Um, and then just faith that this moment won't be forever. I remember times when in China, you know, when I had hit my rock bottom, I literally would talk, okay, this, it's so cliche, but I believe that cliches are cliches because they're true. And it's so (laughs) cliche, but like this too shall pass. I will be on American soil again. (laughs) I will say, you know, sometimes in like my darkest moments, I will smile again. I'm not smiling right now, but I know I will smile again. And just, I'm not saying like go to, you know, toxic positivity, but giving ourselves that tool to have faith and gratitude that in this moment, I'm miserable, but it's not going to last. And I have everything that I need. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for all of that. There were so many things that I was like, oh, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about this. That was so good. Okay. <laughs> I'll be quiet for a few minutes. <laughs> no, no, it was, I, I, one of the things that you said that really hit me and because I've been talking to a few people that have, are dealing with some major grief right now is I love that you said that it, it, you get, you have permission to have grief be whatever it needs to look like for you, you know, and it comes in waves and there will be things that you don't expect that, will just trigger that grief and other things that you would maybe be afraid that would that don't affect affect you that way like it's just it's so your own experience and it's so individualized and people don't yeah you you can't control it necessarily right. and that's where the acceptance comes in like okay it's time to do some grief again it's okay and breathing through that and grief is not always like forward like lateral right like two steps forward one step back Like, you know, anger does revisit itself and, and that's where the self-compassion comes in. It's like, okay, I'm not done being angry about this and that's okay. 
Yes. Yes. Because if we try to push it away, I, this is a, a truth that I <laughs> firmly believe. Um, if we're, if we're resisting emotions and trying to push them away, then uh, cliche here, what you resist persists, right? <laughs> like it's a truth. Right. Like you, you, the harder you push it away, the more it's going to want to hang out with you. This, I don't know if I've shared this um, example on my podcast yet or not, but I love this analogy of emotions being like a beach ball and if you are resisting it's like you're pushing it under the water and the further you push it the harder you're pushing it one it's taking up a lot of your energy it's taking both of your hands all of your concentration and energy and the harder you hold it down the harder it's going to just come back up and, and smack you in the face <laughs> it always it, pops back up yes but if you allow it to be there if you're like okay like grief or whatever emotion it is you get to just you can float right next to me here i'm not going to push you away you get to be here as long as you need to it'll eventually just float away it's really powerful <laughs> concept to realize that i if i allow it as scary as that might seem to allow it that's the thing that actually allows it to leave so that's yeah i think a really helpful point to remember to accept the emotions as they come and allow them to be there. And then the tool of bringing yourself back to the present moment and breathing into that and just recognizing I am safe. I'm okay right now. I've been taking a class on nervous system resilience and it's so cool, but the foundation of everything for our nervous system to mm -hmm. be regulated is safety is mm -hmm. we are, I am okay right now. And that, that really is, like you said, it's the first step to, to feeling okay about things and the first step to being able to express and feel gratitude. It just, it's really quite key. So yeah, that faith that things will change in the future and that will, they'll get better, even if they're not okay right now and gratitude and all of the things. It's just, it's so important. So thank you for sharing everything. Sure. It's so good. So another thing that comes up with post-concussion syndrome, and I'm sure this is something that you've also seen, whether it's with concussions or other issues people are dealing with, is emotional challenges, personality changes, irritability, anxiety, depression. So what advice would you give to someone who's trying to love themselves when they're struggling with these types of challenges? Yeah, I love this question. And it all goes back to non-judgment. The more we can take out judgment, the tool of there is no good, bad, right, or wrong. It just is, right? Our emotions, our irritability, it's just information. If we detach, if we release those judgmental attachments that we have to depression, you know, I know that when we go to dark places that fall into the realm of depression, the first thing that comes up is fear. Oh my gosh, how long is this gonna last? Is this my life now? Am I going to be one of those depressed people that can't dig myself out? When we go to all of that fear and anxiety, that actually attaches us to it. So if we can just say, I'm feeling really low and really dark and it scares me. I don't know how long it's going to last. But like you said, I mean, science has proven that emotions only last 90 seconds if we don't attach to them. Now, I'm not talking about clinical depression or you know things that are chemical imbalances. That's not what I'm discussing. Diagnose, you know, diagnose these things because I definitely don't want to, you know, diminish or minimize somebody that has a diagnosis or true chemical imbalances. If it persists, that's more information. And then we get to, again, be aware, oh my goodness, I've been feeling like this now for quite a few days. Instead of judging it, oh, my whole world, you know, what? then that's the awareness, except I have never felt like this before. Now, what action can I take? We always jump from that awareness to our action. And sometimes we take action out of anxiety or if, we, if we're taking action out of fear or emotion, it might end up, it usually ends up causing more strife for us down the road. So if we can just sit in the acceptance of, okay, I'm seeing something show up in my personality that is different, that I've never seen before. I'm not going to judge it. It's scary and that's okay. But what actions can I take that is actually going to move me 
forward, maybe calling a doctor or talking to a friend or reaching out to that coach that you feel connected to. It's best to kind of sit in the acceptance because a lot of times it just goes away on its own. Yes. I think that concept of just allowing it, sitting with it, and then from a place of acceptance saying, okay, now what, what do we want to do? How do we want to work towards that? But allowing yourself to love yourself, even when you're not showing up the way that you would want to ideally show up. Um, yeah. Because yeah, we get, we get dysregulated. And I think that's something too, to point out is a lot of times with concussions, people get dysregulated and they get stuck in a dysregulated state. They're hyper aroused. They're, they're on that high alert fight or flight kind of way of observing the world and being in the world. And that is what they're viewing everything through that lens. And it's more defensive and it's on the defensive, on the alert. And so recognizing that that's what's going on and recognizing too, that it's a physiological thing. It's not a moral, you don't Mm -hmm. have to judge yourself for it. It's not like, oh, all of a sudden I'm a terrible person. It's, oh, all of a sudden my brain and body are dealing with some things that are making me dysregulated and that's what's going on. And it doesn't mean like you don't apologize if you've lashed out at somebody, right? Like you can still like, Right. That's, I think, an important part of it is, is the self-forgiveness and, and asking forgiveness of others if necessary, but recognizing that it doesn't mean that you are a terrible person. It's just, okay, my brain and body are dealing with things that they're not used to. I need to take a second. And like you said, use it as information like, oh, okay, I see now <laughs> that this, when I'm dealing with all of these things and I'm already in this kind of state that maybe I should pull back for a little bit, to that, let that be a cue to take a rest break or whatever to get myself more regulated before I continue on. So that's, yeah. Yeah. One of my, one of the things that I say to myself often when I'm starting to get triggered or deregulated is this is science. This is science. It, when we say like, this is scientific, it takes that pressure off, right? Like, okay. When I'm super hormonal during the month, Yeah, it doesn't give me a pass to be totally crappy towards someone else, but I can accept that I'm going to get more frustrated. I'm going to want more sugar. And I tell myself, this is science. There's actually things happening in my body right now that are causing this. And I love that we we're talking about nervous system regulation, because one of the things that I really do with my clients under the self-awareness pillar is what does your, cause our body gets triggered before everything else. And so looking at ourself and really understanding what is our body's first clues that we're being triggered or deregulated and everybody's different. So for me, my armpits get itchy. I know it's weird, but like that, again, it's science, you know, the sweat glands in my armpits start to really get hyper, you know, all at once. And so they get itchy and my mouth gets dry because I'm, I'm like wanting to communicate and I can't. And so those are two clues that before, you know, my mind is already like in fight, flight, or fawn mode, but if I can just regulate, or if I can just be an observance of, oh my gosh, the, this is happening to my body. That means I'm triggered. That millisecond of a pause and understanding ourselves is like, okay, now what am I going to, how, what is the best course of action for me through this trigger? Cause I used to be, I let my emotions, great emotions and not so great emotions lead my life. And, you know, I was acting out of emotion constantly and what did that lead to? Constantly cleaning up messes and just so much self-shame of, I wish I could control myself a little bit more. And then once I started learning, oh my gosh, I'm getting triggered. What is the best course of action through this trigger? What is the most loving way through this trigger? And not you know, what is the way through it to where I'm not going to cause destruction (laughs) coming out the other side, huge, huge turning point for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that the awareness really is key and we can spend time really kind of breaking down for ourselves. Okay. What, 
when I'm feeling good and safe and my mind is thinking clearly and I'm able to be at peace, like, what does that feel like? How do I react? What are my facial expressions? What are my, like the muscle tone in my body? How do I feel? How do I respond? Like knowing what safe and regulated feels like. And then also, you know, spending some time recognizing, okay, if I'm, if I'm like, hyper alert and uh, dysregulated in that hyper zone. What does that look like? How do I respond? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What's my body doing? And in the hypo, like what if I'm if I'm on the more depressed side, like what does that end up looking like? So it, it really can be an important exercise to just spend some time understanding what our bodies do. And it's again, it's something that people don't talk about <laughs> very much. We don't, we don't hear people giving this lesson in school and saying, okay, how do you feel now? And when this is happening, what is what is it like? just so that we get that awareness of where we're at emotionally and with our regulation in our system. So that then, yeah, we can, like you said, we can take that pause. We can step back for a second and recognize what's going on for us. And that will give us clues as to what we need to be aware of. So good. Yeah. And because one of the things that I used to do, and I'm just sharing my own personal, because it's such a space of awareness that, that your listeners can go to is where did I feel the worst after getting regulated? Like, where did that shame come from? And the shame came from things that I would say, but I'd say real, you know, I'd say really mean things. My, my primary love language is words of affirmation. And when we're in fear and unsafe, we do the opposite of our love language. Right. And so I would say really mean things and then I'd run away. And then I would go into shame after I, after like all the chemicals were trying to rebalance themselves, I go straight to shame. And I learned to sit in that shame as uncomfortable as it is and ask myself where it's coming from. And from that moment, I learned about myself. First of all, I already know I have shame for saying things that aren't true because I was, you know, in, in fear mode, but running away, abandoning. I felt extreme shame from. So now when I am in that same scenario, I already know if I say things or bail, it's not good for me. I can ask for space. I can ask for a moment. I can breathe. I can get those chemicals regulated on my own now. So that way I don't have to do those actions that brought me to shame. And really the power of the pause is amazing. So it starts with that awareness of what is my body telling me? And then speaking, and I've I've literally, I'm in a new relationship. We're six months in, I've gotten triggered because new relationships bring up a whole bunch of stuff. I've literally said to him, I'm feeling unsafe right now. Just give me a moment to work, to regulate myself. And then we can have a conversation that'll be a lot more rational huge win but that took years to get there mm. and it it sounds like it is that awareness and then practicing those skills to handle it when you're not in the, the moment and the heat of the moment and then you have them available when you are in that moment so that's so good thank you and i think one of the things i don't know as as i have been working with people something that comes up and i i'm glad that you brought up the shame thing i think you know people when they don't handle the moment the way they would like to, and they feel out of control, they, they are really emotional, or they run away, or whatever it is, sometimes, when they think about it later, and they're experiencing that shame, that's where that, uh, the lack of self love comes in, right? They're like beating themselves up. So I love what you said about taking the time to say, what is it about that moment that I'm upset about, and then just kind of trying to work through what could I do going forward? Is that, is that kind of the process? Like, what is it that went wrong and what do I want to do next time? (laughs) Well, and I think it's just facing shame. Let's like, like, let's just talk about shame for a minute because we all carry it. We all have it. It's a human characteristic that is part of our human existence. It doesn't serve us. As a matter of fact, shame is the number one thing to zap our self-love, our self-esteem, our self-confidence. So if we just take shame out of the box and Brene Brown does so much beautiful work around shame and just say, okay, it shows up. It doesn't serve me. I'm not going to demonize it or villainize it. 
But when I feel shame, I just get to face it and say, what is making me feel shame? What did I do? And then we deal with that at hand. Okay. Then we go into the self-compassion. I talk to myself the way that I would talk to my daughter or my son or, you know, my best friend or my partner or someone I truly care about and say, you know what? You did the best you could. You are human. Instead of looking at it as a mistake or something bad, what can we learn from it? What awareness can I gain? And then we're going to try to do better. We're going to take that awareness and we're going to try to do better. And one of the greatest things about having a self-love coach is I am that voice for my clients and I teach them. I talk to them and over time they start talking to themselves. And so a lot of our sessions, that's what I'm doing. You are human. You did the best you could give yourself grace and compassion. You will do better. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't, but that's okay. You're on the path. And I've learned to try to talk to myself like that. Sometimes I don't, and that's okay. But that's the goal is that we can talk to ourselves in that same compassionate voice that we would tell our beautiful children or the people that we love the most. And we get to do that to ourselves. I love that. That is something that I tell my patient or my clients as well is, hey, like, imagine that your best friend came to you and was feeling this way and had all these emotions. You wouldn't kick them out the door and say, hey, I don't have time for you. Or like, no, I I don't want to look at this. You would invite them in. You'd hug them. You'd love them. Or like, even sometimes it's easier for people to relate to a dog, like and a little, like a cute little puppy that's so sad, right? Like, just, just want to hug them or, or yourself as a child. Like, those are ways to like, you just love it's so it's so much easier sometimes to love on those kinds of people and if you can realize you are just as worthy and just as uh wonderful as those people or animals like you deserve that kind of love and compassion that's that's life-changing well what i've come to after working with clients the people who are most loving and accepting and compassionate to others are usually the hardest on themselves. And I believe that they are so abundantly loving and kind to others because that's their inner voice telling them that they could do that to themselves. So I just say, that's really great. You know how to do it. Now you just get to apply it to yourself. Turn it inward. (laughs) Oh my gosh. If I could do it for, like, it's that quick. I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not easy, but it's that quick to just frame your mind of what I'm giving to others. I now get permission to give to myself. It's not selfish. It's not narcissistic. It's not egotistical. It's actually essential to fill our own cup the way that we fill others. Because Mm -hmm. once we do it, we realize, oh my gosh, Now that I'm filling my own cup with all of these things, I get to do it more with others. Like my tagline is we fill our cup so that it abundantly flows over into all aspects of our life. Beautiful. So true. And I love that the abundance concept, because yes, the more love we have for ourselves and for others, it just like grows. (laughs) Love is a beautiful thing. Awesome. So, so how about the people who love and support the person who is struggling with Mm self-love how how can others support and encourage someone in finding ways to love themselves yeah that that wow let's do a whole episode on those people some of my clients like one of my clients her the love of her life has alzheimer's and so taking care again it's like what we just said that person who is supporting someone else going through a life-changing, devastating transition needs to fill their own cup. It's really easy to focus on that other person who is suffering and struggling. And we want to like put our own needs aside to focus on them. That is what naturally feels like. And especially in our thoughts, like obsessing about them and their thoughts and their life and their transition. How can I just make their transition through this journey easier? We've got to just put that all to the side and say, how can I fill my own cup 
so that I can be a support to that person. And really the way that I work with those clients is when they're talking more about that person or that situation, I am just a quiet, loving voice that says, what about you? What about you? And it's okay to say to ourselves, what about me? And so talking to that person who is the support person, it's really essential. 15 minutes of self-connection time every single day. And I say self-connection because it can be whatever makes you connect back to yourself. So for some, that might be prayer and meditation. For some, that might be a nature walk. For some, that might be 15 minutes looking into your own eyes in the mirror. For some, it might be journaling. But I think at least 15 minutes for everyone of self-connection time, but especially people who are going through something with someone in their life that is struggling with addiction or life-changing physical things such as disease or injury or, you know, anything. That's my biggest recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's interesting because when I formed this question, I was like, okay, how can we help other people love themselves? But the key is we can't force anybody (laughs) to love themselves, right? It is, we can show an example and by making sure that our cups are filled, then we are available and able to be there in the way that they need us to be there. That's key. Totally. I mean, when I started this and said, everything goes back to self-love, it really does. It really does. Like if we're more focused on somebody else's journey, that's a, that's a big piece of awareness right there. Mm. Like when I'm starting to think about my boyfriend and his journey more than mine, that's like, it's not like a red flag. It's not like I'm doing anything wrong. It's just awareness of, oh, got to focus inward a little bit more. You know, I've heard drop the magnifying glass and pick up the mirror. That's good. I like that. And one of the things is, is like, what do I want that person to be doing? So if you have a support person, that's like, how do I help them love themselves? You know, whatever you want your person to be doing, ask yourself, are you doing those things as well? Not in like a be mad at yourself type way, but Hey, how can I ask this person to listen to these podcasts or read this book or, you know, get on this journey if I'm not doing it for myself? Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. That reminds me of, uh, I did a podcast episode with Meg Johnson, who has experienced a spinal cord injury and is paralyzed. And she, that was her advice with a, a similar question is like, how can people support people who are going through a hard thing? And she was like, make sure that you are taking care of yourself. That piece is key. And it does tend to be the first thing that goes is the self-care when you're worried about somebody else. And again, I don't think that is, it's not a bad thing to care about somebody else and to want to help them and to be there for them. But really the best way to do that is to be in a, a good place yourself first. And daily. And it takes intention because when we talk about self-care, we're like self-care Sunday, or I'm going to go get a massage, which is all great. But, you know, I always say like, there's a difference between self-care and self-love. Self-care can be a form of self-love, but if we're going to get massages and not really doing the inner work, then it's just a massage. Yes, you know? that's a good point. So are there any other action items that you recommend for someone wanting to love and accept themselves as they are currently? So any other self-love tips or practices that we didn't mention already? Yeah, I'm a big component for a joy list. I talk a lot and this goes under, you know, self-fulfillment and self-awareness, but have an active joy list in your phone where it there's two two parts to having an active joy list because first of all, we are more present when we feel joy. Take out your phone, add it to your joy list. What are you doing? Who are you with? What is bringing you joy in that moment? Add it to the list. It's making you more present to joy. But then, and this is really speaking to your clients who are coming back from concussion or life-changing physical things. When we're low, I always say, go to your joy list and choose one thing and make your joy list things that don't cost a lot of money or are not dependent on other people. Because the first thing we want to say is being with my kids brings me joy. Well, sometimes your kids aren't available. Sometimes they're at school. So make your joy list about you and like really quick. And then, you know, we'll wrap up. But 
I realized I always get that joy chemical when I see little white fairy lights or when I go to restaurants that have white lights in their outdoor space. And so I put on my, I just took out my joy list and I'm like little white lights or white lights. So I came home and I'm like, how do I implement that into my space? So now I, ha I have like this big sailboat in my living room. I put little white lights on my sailboat and every night when I come home, I turn that on at dusk, you know? So having an active joy list is one of my huge self-love tools. That's so cute. I love the sailboat with the white lights. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah, the, um, I know a lot of people, there's music, like certain songs that help oh, yeah. the system. So that's, that's well, on my joy list. I have driving down the freeway with my windows down singing, singing. Oh, I, and I have a podcast episode all about your self-love playlist, like create a playlist of songs that just make you happy and put it on your joy list and play that playlist when you need to, when you need to pick me up. Yes. I love it. This also reminds me of another conversation I had with somebody where they talked about laughter yoga, which I had, have you heard of laughter yoga before? Mm -hmm. I had never heard of it before, but she talked about how our system doesn't recognize the difference between like when we're genuinely thinking something is funny or not, if we're laughing, if we're doing that act, it's kind of like if we're stressed about a test, our body has the same reaction uh, whether we're being chased by a bear or it's a test, <laughs> you know, like the body doesn't recognize the difference. And so with laughing, you can just do this, you know, even a, a fake laugh, <laughs> but like, then it turns into something real and actually like brings your whole system up, which I thought was really, really interesting. I love um, that. Yeah. I, in my self-love journal, it has 52 intentions. And one of the intentions is this week, I will bring more laughter into my week. Because we forget to take time for fun and laughter and joy. And again, a whole nother podcast episode, I do a lot of work with my inner child. And so we can connect to our inner child when we are playful and laughing and having fun. And so one of the things on my joy list is watching stand-up comedy on Netflix and that got me through, you know, I took eight months last year of not dating and really reframing my, my relationship with being alone. And every Friday night, instead of going on a date, I just turned on Netflix and watched a stand-up comedian. And it really raised my vibrations through that time when normally I'd like lean into loneliness. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Connecting with that that inner child. It's funny that we're having this conversation right now because just this past week I was at a destination wedding and we didn't have our kids with us. So I wasn't trying to keep six people alive. And my inner child totally came out. I was like playing in the ocean waves and playing in the pool all day. I was like, I discovered that I don't want to just lay on the beach in the sun and read a book. I just, I want to play. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I learned that about myself. It was amazing. And it was so fun. <laughs> so I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. again, I really believe in inner child work. And so connecting to my inner child on the daily, checking in with her, making her feel heard is incredibly important. It's yeah. huge self-love win. I talk about self-love wins a lot and that's a self-love win. Yes, I love it. All right, so any any other advice that we haven't covered for someone struggling with loving themselves or anything else that you would just want our audience to consider in general? No, I think we've covered a lot of bases. I mean, we could talk for hours. I give a lot of content on my own podcast. I created my podcast to be like the textbook for my clients. So instead of taking time in our sessions to explain principles, tools, and practices, I make podcast episodes about them and then I have them listen to the podcast. So if somebody, you know, really, it's called falling in love with yourself. It really is the blueprint, you know, it's the tools that I've used that I continue to use and what I use with my clients all out there for free. Perfect. And we will definitely link that to the show notes as well as um, to your uh, product that you have on Amazon, the, the self-love journal. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. That was my passion project last year. Um, 52 intentions. So, you know, self-love is intentional. Like we talked about a little bit earlier, 
these aren't things we were ever taught to do, but that are essential for a happy, fulfilling life. And so it takes intention. So I created a journal that you can either go in order or you can choose one randomly. There's a great index in the back. And every Sunday I set an intention and then each day of the week, you just, you know, two sentences about how you live that intention. And through the course, you know, you do that for a couple of weeks and definitely for a year. Oh my gosh, you're going to have such an amazing relationship with yourself. Awesome. So how can people get in touch with you um, if they want specific help with loving themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hang out mostly on Instagram. I, um, my handle on Instagram is Jenny underscore Drake underscore. I am on Facebook. I offer a free private self-love group on Facebook at Jenny Drake. You can find me through Bethany because we are friends. Um, Monday mornings, I'm on Zoom every Monday morning at 8 a.m. for anybody who wants to talk self-love. And that that is just a free resource that I give. It's an amazing tribe. And then my website is jenny-drake.com. All the information for anything we've talked about is on those places. Perfect. And we will yeah, put those links in the show notes. And it, it's 8 a.m. Pacific time? Yes. Sorry. 8 a.m. Pacific time. It's the falling in love with myself tribe. It's so amazing. It's such a safe, beautiful place. And that tribe has been meeting for over two years. And this year they're like, Jenny, host a retreat for us. So I'm hosting my first falling in love with myself retreat. It's at the beach in October. Everyone is welcome. Well, this is a women's retreat. So if you're a woman, you are welcome. And it's going to be three days at the ocean here in sunny Southern California in October, all about self-forgiveness, self-soothing, self-celebration. We don't celebrate ourselves enough. We, we are so embarrassed about, you know, tooting our own horn and that, yeah, no, like in this self-love journey, we toot our own horns and there is no win that is too small to celebrate. So oh, I love it. That sounds like it would be so fun. <laughs> so it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming today and sharing your wisdom. And I really um, appreciate everything that you've shared with us and yeah. feel the, feel the truth in it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bethany. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. Have a great one. I'm so glad you listened in today. I hope you have gained some helpful insights and inspiration regarding dealing with and recovering from concussions. My goal is to create more awareness and education about concussions and the fact that there is so much that can be done to improve life after someone has had one. Help me spread the message by liking, commenting, rating, and subscribing to this podcast and share it with others who would benefit from hearing it. There are more resources available on my website. And again, if you or someone you love would benefit from concussion coaching, sign up for a free consultation using the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Thank you. See you next time and take good care of that amazing brain of yours.